Good morning. There we go. All right, you paid attention right away. Happy Sabbath. How is everyone? Are you doing okay? I'm excited. It is a very special Sabbath morning with the emphasis on the mission work. Amen. We are called to do God's work, not just in the United States of America. However, I'm sure that work is also needed in the United States of America, right? But uh, all over the world and uh, the Gospel Outreach is doing an amazing work. And this morning the Gospel Outreach is represented here in our church by the Meloshenko family. So we are so excited and so blessed to have Meloshenko family with us and they will lead us through the service and I am grateful to Ed Wright who planned this event and he was here with us the first service he is possibly still with us in the lobby but uh, uh, he is still very active in the ministry in this area and beyond so we will have a very special service as you see they are ready to start singing Do 
something special here this morning as we've come to worship him to lift up the name of Jesus one of the things we love to do is to hear our people lifting their voice in praise and it's now your turn to stand as we sing together our opening hymn the lyrics are on the screen to God be the glory great things he has done but I'm going to add a little sub note to that great things he is doing amen to a choir. Let's do it. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things. Upon to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear. church family this morning as we've come together to worship. May our words with the music, may the meditation draw us closer not only to each other but especially to you. We love you Lord. Thank you for this Sabbath we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
one of my favorite things to do in life is hang around with kids. My whole ministry was as a youth pastor and a youth director, and so even though I have a few years of water under the bridge, I still love our kids. And you know what term, time it is. You get to go and people can hold up those fives and tens and twenties and hundreds, and then you get to collect them and bring them right up here to the little box. So while the children are coming forward, I'm going to ask you to hold up that the offering for the children's ministry here in this church. And then when you get all the money in the box, come on and sit right over here with me on this step. school box this morning. Well, there's some pictures that you're going to be able to look up here on the screen, and I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> now, this happens to be a map. Now, I know some of you are too young to even know what a map looks like, but this is a map of a country that's literally halfway around this world. Thousands of little islands make up the country of the Philippines. Now, I'm just wondering if there are any Filipino members of the Uldawa Church. If there is, would you say Mabuhay? Okay, well, I guess I got shut out. <laughs> First service, we had a few uh, Filipinos here. Well, in one of the little very remote islands, the boys and girls there did not know how to read. They didn't know how to write. And so the the chief of the village said, we need to have some teachers come here to teach our kids how to read and write. Do you know how to read? You do? You know how to write? Oh, you must be really smart. How about you? Do you know how to read yet? Good for you. Well, these boys and girls didn't know how to do that. And so they built a little school. Now, you, this little school, you see it on the right side there. It has the flagpole made out of bamboo and thatched roof, and they had told the kids, hey, we're going to have school. You're going to learn how to read and write. Well, they had so many kids that showed up the first day of school, they had to put the younger children in the morning and the older children in the afternoon. Now, that's their desk, so they get to sit on the dirt floor. But that's where they were learning how to read and write. They even found an old blackboard, and they brought that in there. Well, they were not only learning how to read and write, but they're learning stories about Jesus and they're learning how to sing together. And they were having, these kids were having the best time of their life. Well, the problem was the village chief, also known as the witch doctor, did not like what was going on. They're learning too much about that Jesus stuff down there. We gotta put an end to that. And so he said, no more school. 
oh, the kids were so sad. And he said, we're not having any more school until we bring everybody in the village together and we're gonna, and we're gonna let them know who's boss around here, which God we serve. And you see, the village chief, he didn't know who Jesus was, but he worshiped other gods. And then he did something. Now, do you like gross stuff? Uh, some of the boys go, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this is gross. So what the chief did, he had one of the boys run out to the village and get a white chicken. And now this is the part that's gross. He chopped the chicken's head off. And he took the chicken by the legs and whoosh, he started throwing it around, blood spurting everywhere. And he's yelling and screaming and shouting for his gods to come because he was gonna to prove to those teachers and those boys and girls whose God was in charge. And what he did, he had in his hand, he had a goat's horn, two stones, and two pieces of metal. Now, this man Young right here, do, do stones float? No. Does metal float? Nails? No. But he said, I'm gonna show you, my God is gonna make those float. And so he, he showed the teacher what he was going to do, that there's a basin of water there. He's going to dunk those things in the basin of water, and his gods are going to make them float. So after an hour and a half of screaming and shouting and dancing and squirting blood all over the place, nothing happened. Nothing. He was very upset. And he turned to those two teachers and said, okay, it's your turn. See what your god can do. And so now the contrast here, he is he's shouting and screaming and yelling. Those two teachers very quietly, they knelt in that dirt right there and they prayed a very soft prayer. God, you're God who loves us. You're God, we don't just scream at you. You're God, we're down in the river with Elijah. Remember those boys that were chopping the wood and ax head flew in the water? Lord, we know you're a God that can perform miracle here. Amen. He stood up, went over, he knelt down, dropped the, the goat's horn, dropped those two stones, those two pieces of metal in that basin of water, boom, and they sunk to the bottom. But then you know what happened? They all came floating to the top. The village people looked, what? That's the God we want to serve. And so you know what happened? They all went down to the river, every one of them, and they were baptized. And now we have a, not only a school there, but we have a Seventh-day Adventist church. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Now, i got to tell you, we're still working on that witch doctor and his wife. They still haven't quite seen the light yet. But aren't you glad you serve a God? That there's such a loving God that wants to show his love and mercy to people, even in these mo most remote parts of the world. Let's have a prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you for these boys and girls that are here this morning. Lord, they go to Sabbath school. They learn about Jesus. But more importantly, Lord, most importantly, Lord, they learn about how much you love us. And Lord, we want to lift up those kids there in that little island in the Philippines and that witch doctor and, and those teachers who's there and just continue to bless them. May they know more about your love and, and that you're coming soon. And we want to be ready for that. Lord, for these boys and girls here, bless every family, their parents, their grandparents, their brothers and sisters. Lord, we love you. Just bless us now in this Sabbath so as we continue together. And all the children up front said what? evangelism and the mission work all over the world and of course in our own area in Georgia and Eastern Tennessee. So today the offering is specifically for Georgia Cumberland Conference evangelism. So deacons, please come forward and we will say a prayer. 
our Heavenly Father. We are grateful that your word is being preached all over the world, including our own area here in Chattanooga, Collegedale, Ultawa, and beyond. Lord, there are so many needs and so many people that still need to know that Jesus is coming soon. Yes. Bless our donations this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Good morning. I invite you to open up your Bibles and turn to Romans 10, 13 through 15. I'm going to read, be reading from the NIV this morning. Everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they, that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Amen. anniversary just a few weeks we've been married 57 years the second son of Joe and Ann is Jody my brother Jody is the one who's actually taken over the music ministry that mom passed away several years ago and I'm so proud of what Jody has continued to do to keep the brothers together bring them from different parts of the planet we've traveled to different continents we've been to Australia and we've been to New Zealand 
and uh, overseas, Russia, Ukraine, and Jody and his wife, Judy, they have several children, one of whom is the real star here today because she is of the next generation. And Joanne, we're so proud of her because my dad and mom always wanted a girl. And they finally got a granddaughter, first one, Joanne, after mom and dad. Joanne, we're so glad that you came from Oracle, California. Your family's back there. Thank you for sharing Joanne today. Dallas is the middle brother. He's teaching school in a little mission place way up south of the Canadian border of Washington State with his wife. Then there's Eugene. He lives down here in Tennessee with his wife. They have several children. And some will be joining us in Florida in just next week when we're going to be there at the Avon Park community areas. And what's the other place, Jody? Deltona. Deltona. If you have friends that are going to be down there, we'll be there next weekend. Uh, Rudy is the youngest of the tribe of Joseph. They always said I was spoiled, and you should have seen those hand-me-downs after they came through four brothers. <laughs> the pictures of the family up there, one of the ones that we cherish. We were just young kids growing up in New England. By the way, I met somebody who was at our concert, Jody, who's sitting right here in the fourth row oh, wow. in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, wow. When we were there with the Hayward brothers. There's a picture of my dad and mom and all the family. We went to Canada just a couple of years ago. We're just so glad that this portion of the family could be here. And thank you for coming. But especially, we invite you to make sure you come to the very special gospel concert that will take place with a lot more music this afternoon at 6. 6 o'clock, the community church. I want to, Brad uh, Petrov. Come here. They don't know me by that name. <laughs> You have one of the finest pierogi eater pastors on the planet, right here. <laughs> Pierogies. Shows. <laughs> Lonnie, the memories we have 30 years ago when we went to Perm, Russia. This is just right after the, um, the, the Cold War had ended, and evangelists went. To just share just a few minutes about our experience there, Lonnie and Peter. We had an unusual experience of meeting Peter Kulikov. His father was a president of the Eurasian Division, which included, used to be called the USSR. Soviet Division. And when Gorbachev dismantled the Soviet Union, a young man had the courage to go into the Kremlin and say, well, we're no longer communists. Couldn't we have a religious program? Or who would do it? Well, I could do it. I live down here in Tula. Peter Kulikov actually went on the air 11 time zones, the entire Soviet Union knew the name of Peter Kulikov. I feel so important. He actually, he actually would, he invited people to write in and ask questions, and they did. He had no staff, he had no secretary, only him, and I was actually there. And he took me out, it was about three feet of snow in what he called his little chicken coop hut office, packed to the ceiling with envelopes from people who'd been writing in from 11 time zones. 500 letters a day. And I said, Peter, what are you doing with all of these people who ask requests? I don't have a staff, I don't have a secretary, I don't even have a Xerox machine. I have a dear old babushka, she comes in twice a week, and we open the envelopes and take out the rubles because people were sending money saying, please send me something about Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, we take out the rubles. And I get choked up, Peter. I know. You took me outside to an incinerator and you said we burn those by the tens of thousands every week. Not the rubles, but the letters. The letters. <laughs> yeah. And I fell down onto my knees and I said, Peter, you cannot do that. We have to start a Bible school here. Well, how do we do that? What's a Bible school? Voice of Prophecy. We went back to the camp meetings all across North America, raised tens of thousands of dollars, and we sent money, and they started the very, very first ever Bible school right there at his little hut office, and that eventually evolved into the media center. Hold on. Uh, one day, my phone rang at home, those old phones, you know, where you pick up the receiver, and I hear Lonnie's voice, and he's saying, I'm here in Russia, and I know you need some money for the computers for the Bible school. So I brought you $30,000 in cash, he says. And he says, if you need the money, come and get the money. He didn't make me wait. So I was already in the car driving to Zaoksky with my suitcase, the briefcase. I got there, he loaded it with cash. So I felt like mafia that day, you know, <laughs> having all those stacks of the US dollars that were 
turned into a number, a, and a big number of computers. And we hired people, and we were able to process all those requests that were coming from all over the Part of that had Soviet to do with Union. Eventually, development of the Bible School, and then the Media Center, and Zayovsky Seminary, yes. and all those wonderful things began because God inspired a young man to go to the Kremlin and say we ought to have a Christian program on the air, and he became the speaker. Well, fast forward, we went back, Jody and I, and Voice Prophecy team, Jeannie and I, my mom and dad were still alive, they sang in Russian and Ukrainian, and we went a thousand miles east of Moscow to a city called Perm, and Peter was my translator. <laughs> and we not only had, well, how many baptized? Your dad was there, and he sang so well, and he was preaching powerfully, I loved him. And you too. We had two churches. <laughs> anyway, Peter, thank you for inviting us to come today. We got a wonderful program. We're honored to have you here. We had 400 plus baptisms there, and the church was established. Praise God for your family. Amen. Thank you, Galena, for sharing Peter because you. Galena couldn't be there in Perm. She was pregnant at that time. She was expecting Barbie. So I don't know if Barbie's here or not. Not not this moment. Thank you. Well, again, it is just a real joy for our family to be part of this church community this morning. And for those that are online, welcome. Um, the whole focus today is on missions. And as far back as I can remember as a child growing up, I knew that I belonged to a church that took very seriously the great gospel commission that's found in Matthew 24, 14, that tells us to go into all the world, preach the gospel as a witness unto all nations, and the end will come. And then of course we know the passage in, in Mark uh, 16, 15 as well, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. So as a, little, as a little kid, maybe 10, 11, 12 years old, we had moved from the farmlands of Saskatchewan, Canada, we were definitely hick hayseed kids. Moved into Springfield, Massachusetts, where my dad and our family began our music ministry together, just a few miles off from Hartford, and uh, got to go to camp meeting. That first camp meeting changed my life because now they knew that they knew the secret to getting the kids back to the evening meeting. You see, you'd hear a, a chapter one of a story from Josephine Cunnington Edwards, and then right at, the, right at the most exciting part of the story, she would say, oh, boys and girls, I've run overtime. You're gonna have to come back tomorrow night to hear the rest of the story. Remember that? But in my little heart, I just knew that my church took seriously missions. It is the lifeblood of the church, it's been the lifeblood of the church ever since day one. Now sadly, the enemy of our souls does everything he can to get us in, to focus on stuff that has nothing to do with people's salvation, but a lot to do with our culture and the traditions that kind of we fit into our little box. I was laughing when I was sharing this this morning. Um, most of my career was in youth ministries and a youth pastor friend and I were together having breakfast and he. He said, Jody, I'm, I'm not looking forward to our church business meeting tonight. It's going to be a shootout. I said, really? Tell me what's going on. He said, well, you see, we are going through one of the most cursed events on the planet. We're going through a church remodel. <laughs> now, I will stay off of that one because I, anyway. <laughs> And he said, you see, this half of the church, they want blue carpeting. And this half over here wants green carpeting. And the blue carpet people have given more money than the green carpet people. But our interior designer says it needs to be brown. You know, so that kind of thing. I thought, oh boy, there we go again. So I told Jim, my friend, I said, you know, somebody shared a motto with me that I have carried with me in all of my ministry, in my family, everything I do, I've adopted this motto. And you might want to write it down because it's fairly, it's fairly simple, but it goes like this. The main thing is that the main thing is the main thing. Are you with me? So the question needs to be asked as a church, what's the main thing? 
Why are we here? I just read it. And, um, but part of that great gospel commission tells us that we need to go into all parts of the world, and that's the head scratcher. Lord, all the world? There's some places on this planet you and I can't get there from here. And if we did, we wouldn't last more than two minutes as a Westerner. And so this is where the head scratcher kind of saw some light. <clears throat> I remember I was about 11 or 12 years old, began a camp meeting, returned missionary, sharing this story, and they said this. You know, we've lived in such and such a country for seven or eight years. We're just beginning to know the people. We're just starting to learn the language and the culture. And a little light went on in my head that went something like this. Lord, don't you have some indigenous, don't you have some local folk down there that we could train to share the message of the gospel in a much more effective way? Bingo, that's the exact reason that gospel outreach was established 30 years ago. And you're going to hear a lot about gospel outreach today. I've been reading through the Bible again. I've done it every year. I'm taking a little bit from the Old Testament, some chapters in the New Testament, and then I read some Psalms every single day. And I'm up to the book of Romans. Take a look at that scripture reading that was read this morning. Romans chapter 10. Would you take that right now and look in your Bible? My favorite hero in scripture. I've got a lot of them. Moses and Joseph and uh, Esther. But Paul is one of the most intrepid, courageous missionaries ever who didn't want to go and talk to people who just knew about the Messiah. He wanted to go only to places that never heard of him before. Now I want you to put on your seat belts because he's going to ask us four pointed questions here and he's going to push you off your comfort zone. Here he says this in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15, and it was his journey to Rome that precipitated these words. He said to them, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Can you say amen to that? An Adventist can say that? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? Amen. amen. And then he throws out this four-part question that you can just sense his anguish and deep longing for all the people back there in Rome and other churches on his journey. He says, but how can they call on him unless they believe in him? Hmm. <coughs> and then he says another question. But how can they believe in him if they've never <coughs> ever heard of him? And next question. How can they hear about him unless someone tells them. Ooh, now, now the final question. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? Are you ready for this? Jody and I, a couple of years ago, uh, received word from the brethren that we were retired. But HMS Richards always said, but Lonnie, the word retirement is not in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus says you must occupy till I come. <laughs> the Meloshenko family, hearing about the volunteer ministry, all volunteer for gospel outreach, headquartered in College Place, Washington, are all in for this new ministry that is to reach out into the 1040 window. And I want to just have you look at a video for four minutes right now. They'll tell you a whole lot more about gospel outreach and their ministry and where Paul's missionary journeys were in the 1040 window. Watch the screen. Them shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Join us now for a journey that may change forever your understanding of foreign mission work and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Today we travel to an area of the world largely ignored by Christians. Known as the 1040 window, it's located between 10 and 40 degrees north latitude in the Eastern Hemisphere. 
It stretches from North Africa toward the rising sun, across the Middle East, India, China, and southward to catch Thailand and the Philippine Islands. All told, nearly 70 countries lie within this window. The area accounts for one-third of the world's land mass, yet more than five billion people live here. That's two-thirds of the world's population. Poverty, hunger, illness, illiteracy, oppression, idol worship, fear, and hopelessness are ways of life for many. Dominant religions include Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Worldwide, an estimated 3.2 billion people have yet to hear the gospel. If you were to guess what percentage of these unreached people live in the 1040 window, what would you say? 40%? 60%? Actually, the stunning answer is 97%. Virtually all of the world's unreached people live in the 1040 window. We've shared the gospel close to home, but have left one final frontier for evangelism. Millions of people in the 1040 window haven't, even once, had a chance to hear the gospel. Despite the great need in the 1040 window, less than 2% of Christian mission giving goes here. There is enough evangelism taking place today to reach the world dozens of times. Unfortunately, most of it is happening among people who have already heard the gospel. In all candor and to our continuing shame, let us admit that the world's perishing unreached people are very seldom mentioned or thought about in almost all churches. Gospel Outreach was founded in 1993 to help introduce people to Jesus in the 1040 window. The all-volunteer staff works closely with the church. The goal, raise funds to support indigenous evangelists and Bible workers. These workers are hired and trained by local church conferences. Through the Gospel Outreach Adopt-A-Worker program, a worker can be sponsored for $150 U.S. dollars monthly. Compared to foreign missionaries coming into a country, indigenous workers have many advantages. They already know the culture, the religion, the language, the traditions, and the people. Gospel Outreach is the heartbeat of the South Asia Division. Hundreds of thousands of people have given their hearts to Jesus and chosen to be baptized as a result of Gospel Outreach-sponsored workers. Not only are these Bible workers effective, they are also efficient. On average, very few dollars invested in their work results in a decision for Jesus that leads to baptism. In the 1040 window, millions and millions of honest-hearted people are searching. They need hope. They need the Savior. Yet they have never had the chance to hear the story of Jesus. Today, it's up to us to make a difference. We must help hasten the Lord's return. We believe. Let's act. And all the people said, Amen. it's an amazing ministry that is doing an, a wonderful, wonderful work. But, you know, I'm a simple kind of a guy. You know, make it plain to me. And when I saw this video first time a few years ago, it struck me. 97% of the people that not, have not heard about Jesus live in the 1040 window. That means we've done a really good job in the rest of the world. I wish I could stand in front of Brother Ted Wilson and every conference and union president, every evangelist and every pastor here in North America and tell them very plainly, for every dollar we spend in evangelism here, we need to spend at least twice that amount in the 1040 window because that's where the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Are you with me? And the things that are happening over there right now are just really, really thrilling. Um, 
As you saw, Gospel Outreach started in 1993, 30 years ago. And they had just a handful of Bible workers that they sent to the Philippines. Today, I am just so thrilled to tell you that in the 1040 window, and by the way, the 1040 window, is that a new concept to some of you? I, I know it's a term we've kind of thrown around for a while. 10 degrees north latitude to 40 degrees north latitude in the eastern hemisphere. Um, that's where the work is being uh, focused for gospel outreach. We have no uh, Bible workers in any other region of the world. Um, anyway, 2,300 Bible workers in 52 of the 70 countries. It's just a thrilling thing to see. And this is typical of the Bible workers. They meet people on the streets in little town square. Many will hike for miles and miles and go up to a very simple little hut in a little village and they share the story of Jesus. And many of the Bible workers have been trained to use stories. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why the Lord used parables so often. But they use stories, biblical stories to to, to share the truths of the gospel with the people that, that you know, need a simple way of understanding Jesus. Many of them have been trained in health ministries, and many of them become the only health educator, the only physician, quotes, nurse, whatever, in a village, and so they become very, very involved in the lives of the people in these villages in helping them with their health and, and diet and so forth. Some of the areas that our Bible workers have been assigned is to some of the refugee camps. And if you want to go into an area that shows destitu destitution in a very radical way, that's, that's an amazing assignment. Their baptistry in most of their villages looks something like this. Uh, whether it's a lake, a stream, a river, a dirty pond, whatever it might be, that's where baptisms take place. Now, I hope you picked up in that video that one of the most effective ways that Gospel Outreach Bible workers, the reason they're so effective, they already know the language, they know the culture, they know the traditions, they know the religion, they know the people, and so they're miles ahead of a Westerner coming into a community trying to, you know, start from scratch. We don't know the exact number because in some of these areas, you just can't declare yourself a Christian or an Adventist because you would be, you'd disappear. But we estimate in the 30 years that Gospel Outreach Bible Workers have been working in the 1040 windows, they've had more than 2 million converts to the church. It's an amazing experience. And I gotta tell you, about a friend of mine who we worked with for a number of years. My wife and I uh, led out in the youth and young adult ministry uh, missions project with, with Quiet Hour for many years. And Bill and Jackie Tucker, the director speaker, are dear friends of ours. And even after Bill retired, he still goes back to the Philippines to do evangelism. That's where he grew up as a kid. He went to academy there. He has a real connection with the Filipino people. And so he went down to the very difficult region of the Philippines, in the southern Philippines, known as Mindanao. And Mindanao is a high concentration of, of Muslims. And um, in that region, he had five or six gospel outreach Bible workers that a year or two before he got there, they started getting the word out in the different villages and the communities about this evangelistic series that was coming. That's interesting. We met a Filipino pastor who had worked in Mindanao, and he says, you know, it's just a lot different than the Philippines. The Christians and the Muslims and the Jews and the Hindus, we all, we all know how to get along. So after Pastor Bill, the ground work is done, he held this evangelistic series. And this just shows you how the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Pentecost is alive and well. They had over 12,000 baptisms. That's what's happening. Can you imagine if in the... Uh, Georgia Cumberland or Kentucky Tennessee conference, some evangelism came in, evangelists came in and had a thousand baptisms. You wouldn't know what to do with them. Twelve thousand. Now you have to understand, our family is. We have evangelism to the core. My dad was an evangelist. Uh, some folk here 
came up to us and said, yeah, we met your dad and mom back in such and such a community. And my dad's heart was in evangelism, but I can remember many times he'd come back from a series of meetings and, and he'd have this real concerned look on his face. He said, Jody, you know, up here in such, such a place in Michigan, they spent they spent $100,000 on this evangelistic series and we had 18 baptisms. He said, I, I don't know, I, I just feel guilty that I'm spending the Lord's money. That How can we be more effective, basically was his question. Well, I didn't know about gospel outreach then, but I wish I did. Pastor Bill, when he was down there in Mindanao and they published in Quiet Hour Magazine, you know, 12,000 baptisms. Pastor Bill said, you know, he says it's like this. Yeah, Quiet Hour got the credit, but it was those gospel, these Bible workers did all the work. And he said, I'm reminded of a, of a, a story, that, uh, a legend of two buffaloes that are working out in the field, plowing all day long, working, tilling the soil, getting it ready for planting. And then right at the end of the day, two little birds come and they jump in the back of one of each one of those and they, they announce to the world, we are plowing. We are, <coughs> you get the point, don't you? Well, I want to share a picture right now of a group of the gospel of these Bible workers that met a few months ago in India at our church headquarters, several hundred of them. We, they met and they were trained new procedures, new new tactics for reaching the people. From that group, the story emerged that is going to thrill your heart. This is a picture of Pastor C.J. Saman. Pastor Saman, who's kneel, he's there being ordained, being uh, having a dedication service. Pastor Saman is a former Pentecostal Pastor, He's actually the head of all the Pentecostal churches in India. He'd be like our North American Division Ministerial Director. As he was studying and preparing for a sermon, over and over and over again, he became convicted that there's something to the Sabbath. And so he prayed for the Lord to send someone that could help him work through his Bible study on the Sabbath. God answered his prayer. A couple of gospel workers, Bible workers met him and they spent months studying with him. Pastor Saman appeared before his church congregation after that series of studies and he announced to them, friends, you've not done nothing. This has nothing to do with you, but I have to resign my position. Well, you can't resign your position until you tell us why. Are you sure you want me to do that? Yes. So for the next several months, Pastor Saman shared the good news of the Sabbath and the three angels' message, and almost the entire church was baptized. Can you say amen? amen. amen. A few of them kind of got this. They changed the plaque on the front of the church, Seventh-day Adventist Church, but it even gets better because Pastor Saman, he has such a, such a passion for the Sabbath and the three angels' message that he has a great confidence, the confidence of all of his other Pentecostal pastors. They see him as, as, as their mentor. And so he has a podcast and he's developing uh, online a series of studies where his, his goal is to convert every one of his Pentecostal pastors to the truth of the Sabbath and the Seventh-day Adventist message. Can you say amen? amen? That's what's happening in our world, friends. We don't see it here in America, unfortunately. One of the challenges is in, in India is their Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi. Narendra, Mo, Narendra Modi is a very, very militant Hindu. And his goal is to get India, he wants to bring all India back into the family. He wants all of Indians to be Hindus. So any non-Hindu religion, he would like to kick out of the country. And so now they've actually passed a bill in Parliament, in Parliament where every non Hindu organization needs to be examined by the government to determine whether these Christian organizations or whoever it might be, whether they're buying converts or not. 
You see, they're accusing Christians of, of paying these people to have, get converts. And are they really, are they doing anything to benefit the, the people of India? Or are they just trying to, you know, raise their membership numbers and, and, and increase their coffers? Well, as you can well imagine, that has been an area of deep concern for the Adventist Church and gospel outreach. They have not examined the Adventist Church yet, but we're one step ahead of them, we hope. All of the gospel outreach Bible workers' wives through an organization in Portland, Oregon called, called Ultimate Missions. It's a very health-based organization where we're gonna be training. We're gonna do training of all of the spouses of the Bible workers in health education. So that when we get examined, the people are gonna say, oh, no, 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 those people, they really help us a lot. They, they've educated us, they've, they've ministered to our physical needs, you know, they've, they've done everything so that will be an incredible blessing. I don't know how many of the wives that we've trained so far, but it's quite a few. So you need to just lift up our work in India. Um, I just have to show you one picture though. Probably one of my favorite pictures. I didn't take it, but I wish I knew who did. Uh, here's a little, let's see, did I turn this off? I hope not. Yeah. Yeah, next picture. I think I'm dead up here. Here we go. As many of you know, <clears throat> there was a time in India where the caste system ruled how everyone lived. They've outlawed the caste system in India a number of years ago, but they still practice it. And the caste system basically goes like this. If you're born in an upper caste system, you get all these special privileges. If you're lower caste, you cannot educate or buy, your, <clears throat> buy yourself out of that caste system. Can you imagine what it means for a little 13 year old girl who comes from a lower caste system for the very first time, when she gets to know Jesus, she comes to understand that in Jesus Christ, there's no male or female, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither Jew nor Greek, that all of us stand on level ground in front of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine what that would make? She's a girl who was told all her life, you know, she's, less, she's worth less than, than a cow. And now she realizes that she's a daughter of God. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful girl. She's very involved in her local church now, teaching other children about Jesus. Now, um, just so you know, the India Division has requested at least 10,000 more Bible workers. They said we could use 100,000, but they request at least another 10,000 Bible workers just in that country alone because the work is so incredibly, uh, just what's happening is wonderful. Um, I'm going to put a pause right now for a minute because we're very privileged to have with us not only our Gospel Outreach president, Brent Scully and his wife Heather sitting somewhere in the audience. There they are. But we also have a, a, the people in the blue shirts you see around. Those are Gospel Outreach volunteers. We have a very effective television and media ministry through Gospel Outreach. And let's face it, that's the new technology and that's where we need to be. Aaron and Alexi Rittenauer are part of that crew that put together our media productions. And I've asked Aaron and Lexi to come up right now to just share just a little glimpse or two of what is happening in their world. We are so privileged and blessed to be involved with this organization. You know, Jody, these stories that you're telling us, we've firsthand gotten to experience these things. We have seen how the Lord is working through our gospel outreach workers throughout the world. And it's just been an honor to be able to see that. And we have a video that we'd like to show you. We actually just returned from a three-month trip overseas 
visiting six countries filming season two of this television show that we're filming called Destination 1040. And um, we visited six countries and we were on 31 flights in three months. So a lot of work, we're very tired. <laughs> uh, but we want to show you this video and uh, why don't you go ahead and invite people to go ahead. <laughs> Um, we just wanted to mention tonight we're going to be sharing more in depth of our trip, what we do, um, and that will be tonight at the College Dale Community Church at 6 p.m. Um, we're actually going to be sharing stories from the Philippines, from an island, a war-torn island off the coast of Mindanao. Um, it's a really exciting story. Um, we're really excited to share it with you guys, but here's this video. Yeah, you can go for a little walk this afternoon and then come, come join us. <laughs> My name's Aaron. <laughs> and who are you? <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> My name's Aaron. And my name is Lexi. And we produce a show for Gospel Outreach called Destination 1040. We are currently at Sunshine Orchard. It's on the Thai border with Myanmar, up north. We are here in Thailand filming season two of Destination 1040. I always had a vision of making a television show in the style in which we created Destination 1040. And Gospel Outreach was looking for something new, something different. And so that's where Destination 1040 was born. I would say the name Destination 1040, I think I came up with three names on a tablet and then I closed my eyes and pointed and it was Destination 1040. We're also going to be hosting this show. What was the name we came up with? Destination 1040. Ah! I think the Lord has a sense of humor. I think he chooses the least likely because this is something that I never wanted to do, and yet here I am. And uh, I, I, I doubt you ever imagined being here. No, doing not, this. not filming a TV show. It's not, uh, it's definitely not always easy. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to get the bag up in the bed. Step one, bail out the water. <laughs> Step two, get into the bow with all this camera equipment. And hope we don't fall in. And don't sink. Are you washing the clothes from the water in this pond? I sure am. I'm gonna tear these pants open. Okay. <laughs> I'm almost at the top. <laughs> How many do you do before you put them down? Uh, for how much you can get in your hand. Tell me about how hot it is. It's just a tad warm. And this is the cooler time of year here. Yes, this is winter, apparently. <laughs> What's happening, lady? I'm not 100% sure. You don't want to lay down? I don't know exactly where we're headed. A fire alarm went off um, in the hall for like two hours. Then there was a loud explosion. And the way that we film things as well, we don't, we, don't reenact, we don't reenact anything. That is one thing I want everyone to know. We do not reenact, if at all possible. We never reenact church services. If you see a church service, it's really happening. If you see a Bible study, it's really happening. We're not doing a mock Bible study just to film. If we are working in the community, if we're helping people in their gardens, if we're out planting rice, whatever we are doing, it is really happening. And because of that, we are constantly filming. We look like some vloggers that just film everything, which is very uncomfortable sometimes. Every time I travel, I'm acutely aware as to how silly it is to just film everything. But it's important. So we're trying to tell you a story. I think oftentimes when we use, when we create uh, foreign mission media, it's always very 
upbeat and positive, which is nice, but then we don't see the reality. We don't see the reality of how these people live. We don't see the reality of how how incredibly difficult it is to live in these different environments. And we don't see how difficult it is to work as a gospel outreach Bible worker in these places. So I, I think when we live with these people for multiple days at a time, and our priority is not always filming. We have a lot of stuff that we do with the people off camera for the simple reason that we want them to feel like we're there for them and we're not there for taking advantage of them. You know, as somebody who is here to make videos, one of the things that's very easy to do is to say, well, let's go to a home, let's get a few shots of praying and reading the Bible, and then let's just leave and go to the next home because we need video of multiple homes. Well, that's something that I promised myself I really didn't want to do when we were traveling. I want to spend the time with the people. I don't care if that means a 45 minute worship time with one specific group. Everybody always gathers around in curiosity when they ask us the drill. Always it's the commotion with the drone. Picture, picture! One of the things that I love and what I've noticed about traveling to these other countries is just how warm and welcoming they are. Like, you don't need to have an invitation to go to someone's house. You just walk right in and they'll feed you this massive feast and give everything they have to you. Like, they, they'll make sure that you have the best chairs, you have the best food. Like, they want to make sure that you feel welcome. Regardless of whether they can afford it. Exactly. If they don't own a chair, they will go around the neighborhood and, and find borrow. a chair for you. Yeah. They are very gracious to us. We have a, a bowl of chilies. we been up to. Oh, they fitted me with a sari. There's a lot of things that we could learn from the people that we meet while we're traveling. Despite the living situations that these people are in, they are so happy, they're so grateful to have what they do have. <laughs> Traveling to these different places and seeing how the Lord is working within the lives of our sponsored Bible workers and also seeing how the Lord is working through them to reach people in remote places, in villages, people who, some people who have never really even heard the name of Jesus, people who don't have even the slightest concept of who Jesus is. I think it's definitely helped to grow our faith. Come on. And I don't really know what I'm trying to say, but what, what, it, what it all boils down to in the pot, the boiling pot, <clears throat> is that I love my wife. <laughs> that has nothing to do with travel. Oh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> if you are watching this video and you have yet to see Destination 1040, I want to encourage you to go and watch season one. Season one is on our Gospel Outreach streaming service. Uh, we do have a streaming service. There is an app that you can download on the Apple Store, the Google Play Store. You can also download the app on your smart TV, like Roku or Apple TV, etc. Go and watch the show. I, we appreciate people who do. If you're inspired by the show, if you want to donate to Gospel Outreach because of Destination 1040, we've been asking people that they, if you donate online, there's a drop-down menu. You can select Destination 1040 as where, as the reason why you're donating. And it's same thing if you send in a check, just write in the memo line, Destination 1040. The reason why we're asking people to do that is we are trying very hard to keep track of the money being raised by this show. The whole reason why we're here filming season two is because of all the money that was raised from season one. Well, we're very pleased and blessed to be able to say that we have now raised almost $200,000 in season and because of the money raised from season one, we sponsored we sponsored yeah. 55 Bible that workers for a year from season one. And this year, the goal of season two is to sponsor 250 Bible workers for one year. That is our goal. 
we prayed about it and we decided that with the Lord's help, we can sponsor 250 Bible workers for a year. 150? 145? Nine? I don't know. That's it. Does that sound like a good one? Doesn't it just thrill your heart when you see a young couple that has dedicated their talents and their time to do something so adventurous? You see, it's it's cool to be adventurous for Jesus. And um, just want to thank Lexi and Aaron for that. Well, we are we are going to have to really wrap things up quickly here. Um, I want to show you a picture of the all volunteer staff in College Place, Washington. Uh, they all share something in common. Can you tell? Somebody said they're geezers just like you. <laughs> These are former, these are conference presidents, teachers, hospital administrators, you name it, who have all come to realize God has called us to keep our shoulder to the plow. And these people are keeping their shoulder to the plow. Because it's an all-volunteer organization, now, this is going to surprise many of you. They're able to do, their administrative costs are about 5%. So 95% of every dollar given to Gospel Outreach goes to one of those Bible workers in the 1040 window. I'm proud to tell you, and I'm just thrilled to know, that there's over 2,000 self-supporting ministries in the Adventist Church, and they're all doing an incredible work. I, I mean, if you support them, right on. But I don't know any of them that can make this kind of a claim that they're able to function on a 5% administrative basis. So that being said, the, the cost of $150 per month per Bible worker, the 2,300 Bible workers we have out there are sponsored by people just like you and me. Person says, yeah, I, I can give $10 a month. I can commit $20 a month or 50 or 100. We have a few folk that have, that have given sizable chunks of money to gospel outreach. And I, I'm not here to, to pat myself on the back, but when our family decided, you know, we're going to just dedicate our ministry to something that is going to make a difference in this world. We did a um, we did a rally at the Loma Linda University Church last year. And after the rally, we got a call from a family that said, you know, our family's been putting aside money for years for a mission project. But we just didn't want to pay somebody's salary. We wanted it to go knowing that it was going to go directly to benefit the workers in a, in a mission field. And the next few days, the Gospel Outreach office received more than $80,000 from this family as they just realized this is something they want to do. Now, that doesn't happen every day, but that's the kind of thing that, that God is doing in the hearts of people. Knowing the time is short, folks look around us. Look how crazy things have gotten in such a short period of time. So our family, we are committed to Gospel Outreach. But I want to just... I want to take just a second to share with you a quote. God's faithful people have always been aggressive missionaries, consecrating their re I got here. resources to the honor of his name and wisely using their talents in his service. What a great text. And of course, we shared this a minute ago. The harvest is plenty and the labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There are literally thousands of Gospel with Bible workers that are ready to go to the field. They just need a little financial help. 75% of all the baptisms in the South Asia, South Asia Division, that's the Philippines, Indonesia, no, maybe it's not the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, that region, 75% of all the baptisms are a direct result of Gospel with Bible workers. Now, part of the sad part of the equation well maybe it's not we want it, we like it the way it is but gospel outreach gets no money from the organized church we don't get funds from the gc or the visions or the unions it's truly a faith-based self-supporting ministry and um, i want to close this morning by just sharing with you an incredible story how gospel outreach bible workers especially now you need to understand there's some of the countries in the 1040 window 
that our gospel outreach Bible workers, if they would declare they're part of a Christian organization, they would be, they would disappear. In fact, I want you to put on your prayer list, I don't know the name of the worker, but in the country of Iraq, we have one of our Bible workers have been arrested for the third time for sharing the gospel, and she is uh, scheduled to be executed. Um, we've had prayer warriors all over the... That's, I'm sorry. These are what people are willing to do for Jesus. We got it really good here, friends. Put these people on your prayer list. But in some of these radical countries, we actually have some Bible workers in a couple of the 1040 countries that has ne there's never been a Christian missionary in a hundred years in those countries. But it's so dangerous, quotes unquote, for these Bible workers that we have to get the funds through them through three or four non-government organizations because if they got money directly from gospel outreach, that gospel, I mean, that's a Christian thing. So there's some creative ways we get funds to those Bible workers. Dreams and visions are very, very important among the Muslim people. Now you need to understand that the Muslim religion has gotten a black eye because of the radicals in that religion but there's a lot of Muslims that are seekers that are that are sincere seekers of the word visions and dreams are very important in their culture there's been if you go look on the website it's called uh, dreams of Isa ISA that's their that's their term for savior and messiah literally tens of thousands of Muslims reporting they've had a dream of a man robed in white, crown of golden crown, arms reaching out, scars in their hands, basically saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Now those dreams are changing. This is gonna thrill you. They're having dreams of three angels flying through the midst of heaven. And the angel turns to them and says, find the people of the book that can explain this vision, this dream. And within the Muslim tradition, they understand before Isa returns, they're going to receive a special message from the people of the book. That's from the Bible. And many, many Muslim clerics have come to understand that the Seventh-day Adventist church is that, are they the people of the book that have a special message? That's what's happening. And I could tell you other stories till the cows come home tonight, but let me just tell you about this one imam. That's the, the cleric. He's walking down his village road one day, and he has a dream. The dream goes like this, part one. Very soon you're going to meet someone that's going to share with you new light and truth. That was it. I don't know if it's the next day or a few days later. He meets two gospel outreach Bible workers, and they start talking and conversing, and he leaves. They separate. On his way home, he has dream part two. Those two men you just met today, they're the ones going to share with you new truth and light. Well, then i got to find them. So he looks, I don't know how many people in this village, but he locates where these two Bible workers were located, and he starts studying. He starts studying the Quran and the Bible side, side by side. He's got a lot of questions. And then he has some questions that are very difficult for the Bible workers to, to explain. So they tell him, <clears throat> we have a cleric friend that can answer these questions for you. And here's his cell phone number. Everybody understands, everybody has a smartphone on this planet these days. Somebody's telling me last night, they said, I think it was Aaron, a couple of guys in the, you know, they're oxen out in the field, plowing rice paddies, and this guy, they got a cell phone, he's, you know, it's crazy. Here's a cell phone number. <clears throat> this cleric will answer these questions for you. So he goes, Calls the number, no service. Now, this is going to thrill your heart. So he's walking home, vision number three. Go out of the south gate of the city up the hill, climb that cypress tree and sit on the first branch and you'll get a cell signal. Now friends, there are dreams and then there are dreams. 
So that cleric now in his clerical robe, he climbs a tree. He's been studying the word of God with this cleric wherever he's located. And in that little village now they have a Seventh-day Adventist Muslim home church. Now in the 1040 window, there are literally tens, we, we don't know, could be hundreds of thousands of Muslim Seventh-day Adventist home churches. You don't know about these because it would be dangerous for them to, to share. Most of the home churches are churches with people, their family and their friends, the ones that are close to them. And that's how the gospel message is, is exploding. I wanted to share that with you to close. <clears throat> you were given a little brochure as you came in. Looks kind of like this. The title of it says, Why I Support This Ministry. I can tell you right now, if you didn't get one, raise your hand, and uh, Brother Ed is going to have one available for you over here. If you want to take one of these to a family friend or someone that you know has a real heart for missions, this tells you more about gospel reach and why we as a family are so in love with this mission, with this ministry. Um, in the middle portion of the magazine, there's an envelope. And in that envelope is an option. There's three ways that you can make a donation this morning. And we're asking for you to consider how you can support gospel outreach. I will just tell you this right now. Most of those 2,300 Bible workers that we have are sponsored by people who say, you know, I can afford $20 a month or $50 a month or whatever it is. The budget last year was nearly $4 million and all that money came in from people just like you and me. And uh, so there's a QR code there. If you wanna click that on your phone, it'll take you directly to Gospel Outreach's website. There's a place where you can set up you know, regular giving. I just to share this with you that Gospel Outreach bases its budget pretty much on people's monthly <coughs> monthly donations. The commitment they make on a monthly basis. Yes, the one-time donations are great, but I'm speaking out of school here maybe. But if you say, you know what, I can give $200 today, why don't you make it $20 a month for whoever? And now they can base their budget on that. Our family, we are in love with this ministry. And in just a few minutes we'll be taking up an offering. And I have something here in my pocket. You're the second group to ever see this. How many of you have a CD player in your car? I should say, how many of you don't have a CD player in your car anymore? Most of you. My daughter told me the other day, she says, Dad, I haven't played a CD for 10 years. So I know I'm really old school. So the fact is our family, <clears throat> we don't have many of our CDs left anymore. We just don't sell them, but we've done something cutting edge. In my hand here, I have a little credit card size, little plastic thing that has a USB right here. You can put it in your car or your stereo, or, I mean your, your computer, whatever at home. This has every musical CD that the family's ever done. And instead of uh, you know carrying boxes and boxes of CDs, this would be this would represent you know eight CDs. What we do for those of you who can make a commitment today for Gospel Outreach of twenty five dollars a month or more, or a one time contribution of two hundred and fifty dollars, we just give you this as a way of saying thank you. And every time you play, you look at you know what we're in love with Gospel Outreach too. So here's what I want you to do: that envelope. If you make a commitment that will qualify for this little thank you gift, my wife and I will be at the table in the back. You come and hand us the envelope and you get the little carrot right here, the little thank you gift. While the ushers and deacons are gonna receive your offering, I'm gonna invite the family to come forward. We're gonna share a song right now that's kind of become our theme song for gospel outreach. We'll be doing this song and having a closing prayer and then we'll be, we'll be done. I wanna thank you folks so much for being so generous with your time this morning. You know, where did the time go? But it's gone, and then some. So in just a minute or two, gentlemen, here's what I'm gonna do. To give these folk a, time, a little bit of time to fill out their envelopes and so forth, I'm gonna hold my hat up in the middle of this song and then you can come and, and, and receive the offering. All right, Jesus, light of the world.
to give us wisdom and courage to step into that 1040 window in any way that we can, whether it's praying, whether it's supporting, whether it might even be in some way going. So until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm. See you at 6 o'clock this evening.